days we live in a world of plenty. Economic growth has produced incredible wealth. Many parts of the world have escaped from economic hardship. Countries like China, which were once very poor, are now solid middle-income countries. But sustainable development calls for prosperity that is broad-based. And despite living in a world of plenty, there are still large numbers of people, more than a billion, more than one out of every seven persons on the planet, living in extreme poverty. What is the face of extreme poverty? If you look at this small holder farmer, uh, this peasant uh, living in northern Ethiopia. There's no uh, modern transport around. Uh, you don't see uh, electricity uh, grids uh, in the distance. You see a pretty parched environment. Uh, that's not a complete coincidence. Uh, a dryland area uh, of uh, poor farmers uh, eking out uh, a living, uh, trying to ensure enough annual food production to feed themselves and their families, uh, maybe to get that surplus to bring to market for a little bit of cash income. Another part of poverty, uh, have a look at a street in a slum of Nairobi. Uh, millions of people live in uh, the slums of uh, African cities uh, like Nairobi. Uh, Hundreds of millions of people live in urban slums around the world. This is another face of poverty. While it remains true to this day that more than half of the world's population living in extreme poverty live in rural areas, of course the urban poverty is known to us. Often the urban poverty is uh, living right next to uh, great urban wealth. And what do we see in this street in Nairobi? We see an unpaved, muddy road. People living without modern power, probably without any modern sewerage or sanitation. In other words, even though these are people living in an urban area of several million people, they're also like that peasant in northern Ethiopia unable to secure basic needs, access to emergency health care, uh, access to basic uh, clean uh, power in the form of electricity or uh, natural gas for cooking, lack of access to safe drinking water and sanitation, and barely eking out uh, a monetary living that uh, can meet even the most basic and minimum needs of clothing and safe shelter. When we speak about poverty, therefore, we're necessarily speaking about a many-dimensional concept. Poverty is usually viewed as a lack of adequate income, but I want us to think about it as a lack of income, a lack of access to basic health services, a lack of access to basic amenities that most of the world takes for granted, safe water, sanitation, electricity, access for children to uh, a uh, decent education. People living in extreme poverty uh, are people who cannot meet these basic needs. And while proportions of the world living in extreme poverty uh, has been shrinking markedly in recent decades, the numbers are still staggering. Depending on one's estimate and one's exact categorization of extreme poverty, it's fair to say that between one and two billion people in the world are struggling to meet basic needs. And probably fair to say that around one billion people struggle for daily survival. Will they have enough to eat? Will polluted water uh, cause a disease that threatens their lives? Will a mosquito bite carrying malaria carry away their child uh, uh, because they can't get access to the 80-cent uh, 
dose of uh, medicine needed to cure the disease. That's the struggle of daily survival for people living in extreme poverty. Where is this poverty? Well, one place to look is the average incomes in different parts of the world. Take the national production of the economy, divide it by the population, uh, so that one gets the amount of income generated per person per year in different countries of the world. And if you put them in a color code, uh, as you see here, uh, you can see a huge variation in income levels around the world. Those uh, dark blue areas, <clears throat> there aren't too many of them, Canada and the United States, Western Europe, Australia and New Zealand, Japan and South Korea. Those are the high income parts of the world. And by and large, extreme poverty has been eliminated from those countries. But take the bright red uh, or uh, beige uh, parts of the world. There you see the greatest poverty. And what you can see very, very clearly in this world map is that extreme poverty today is concentrated mainly in two regions of the world. The first is in tropical Africa. That's the part of Africa uh, in between uh, the northern African countries and the countries uh, at the very south of Africa. And you see, on average, a lot of poverty within those countries, often half or so of the population living in extreme poverty. And the other uh, concentrated uh, part of poverty in the world is in South Asia, India, Pakistan, Nepal, uh, and uh, Bangladesh nearby. Uh, countries that uh, are uh, sometimes experiencing economic growth, uh, but still with vast numbers uh, of people, often in rural villages, living uh, without security of their basic needs. Thank goodness in both Africa and in South Asia, the proportions of households living in extreme poverty are coming down. Thank goodness for the world as a whole, the numbers have been coming down. But clearly, we still have a very serious challenge, uh, a moral challenge and a practical challenge. Uh, people living in extreme poverty face risks of survival. Uh, often, countries uh, where poverty rates are very high succumb to violence, to terrorism, to epidemic diseases, to mass migrations, to environmental disasters that not only are tragedies for them, <clears throat> but can trigger unrest and instability uh, among their neighbors and in other parts of the world as well. We see in the next map another aspect of extreme poverty. People living in extreme poverty face a burden of disease and shorter lives as a consequence uh, that make their lives uh, distinctly more difficult, often more painful and tragic than lives of people uh, in other parts of the world. Once again, where is the concentration shown in this map of high mortality rates of young children? Uh, in this particular map, uh, what's shown is the uh, mortality of children under the age of five. For every thousand births, how many children won't survive till their fifth birthday, what's called the under five <coughs> mortality rate? Once again, we see that Africa is really the epicenter. And tropical Africa is where the highest burdens of disease still reside. It's a stark fact that even in countries where there's a tremendous amount of economic progress, there can still be very significant pockets of poverty uh, that are unrelieved. A lot of inequality, lack of social inclusion, and major gaps between rich and poor. And sometimes the starkness of that is right in front of our eyes, uh, as uh, in the view of Rio de Janeiro uh, that you're looking at right now, where in the foreground you see the low-lying favelas, the slum areas of Rio. And in the background, of course, you see the uh, high-rises, uh, the, the, the modern, uh, very high quality of life. 
uh, of uh, the wealthier people of Rio de Janeiro. While there are some parts of the world where most of the population is poor, there are a number of countries that have reached what we call the middle income status, countries like Brazil, uh, where there still are important pockets of poverty that need to be relieved. As always with sustainable development, there's hope. There are things that can be done to help people meet their basic needs, to help them overcome that daily struggle for survival. One of those opportunities that I find most exciting uh, is shown here uh, in uh, this picture of this uh, valiant young woman, uh, a community health worker, uh, working uh, with her backpack of medical supplies to make sure that if an illness does strike one of those uh, very poor smallholder farmers, uh, one of uh, their children, uh, that there's a cure, a remedy on the way. Uh, and through that, we can extend the benefits of modern uh, health and medical sciences uh, to reach uh, everyone in the world. Well, we've already noticed that the degree of poverty has a kind of geography to it. Uh, on this uh, fascinating uh, uh, depiction of income on our globe, shown not as a map but as a, a globe where the height uh, of uh, each point on the globe measures the economic output of that point, you can see those uh, startlingly high levels of GNP uh, on the islands of Japan. Uh, you can see uh, that in uh, the east coast of Australia, uh, the very high levels of development uh, shown by the markers. But you can also see the low-lying areas uh, in uh, inland China, uh, in India. And the point that I want to emphasize in looking at this alternative depiction uh, of the world economy uh, is that geography of wealth and poverty is complex, not only broad regions, say Europe versus Africa uh, or Japan versus uh, India show stark differences, but even regions uh, within countries, the coastal areas versus the interior of uh, countries show very, very big differences. When we analyze in depth the nature of extreme poverty, the causes of why it continues to this day, even in a world of plenty, we'll spend a lot of time looking at some of these uh, geographic features. Uh, is the country or uh, the uh, city on a coast where trade is easy? Is it in the interior uh, where it might be more economically isolated? Uh, is it in a good climate zone where food production is easy? Or it is, is it in a dryland region uh, as we saw in Carraro, Ethiopia, where uh, food production is a lot more difficult because of the low level and the instability of rainfall. Uh, is it a healthy climate where uh, disease burdens are naturally low? Or is it a place where killer diseases like malaria are more easily transmitted? Geography still today plays a big role in shaping uh, wealth and poverty. By understanding the role of geography, we'll make a big advance not only in understanding why extreme poverty continues in a world of plenty, but what we can do about it.